Um, so I, I'm going to talk about the work we, the digital work we did on the project, but kind of within a context of um, of uh, should I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so w more within a context of sort of overall work we've been doing the last few years at the British Museum, which is how I actually got involved in the project. Um, so I'm mainly based at the British Museum, and, and we've been working on various kind of archaeological digital research activities. So I just kind of highlighted a few here um, uh, that we've sort of been doing in the last few years. So a lot of this is kind of around looking at how we can digitize and increase accessibility to archival material and archaeological collections. So obviously key issues for any museum. Um, <laughs> And so some of the things we've been doing is things like making 3D models and, um, you know, digitizing archives and doing archival, or sorry, um, immersive sort of experiences in 3D printing. So a lot of this work started about three years ago with a project called Micropass, which was AHRC funded. Um, it was a collaborative project between UCL and the British Museum, but also actually lot, we've, we've kind of done the work with lots of different organizations. And uh, we actually did work with SysJack, so that's how we initially got involved with Global Perspectives. Um, but this project was all about public engagement with archaeology, um, and we set up a basically a crowdsourcing platform. Um, also, a bit of crowdfunding, which you can see in there, which didn't quite work out <laughs> that well, so um, we kind of have focused more on the crowdsourcing. But the idea was that we would be putting up things that were kind of miniature projects. Actually, I'll show you the next slide. So. This is our website, um, and so you can see that basically it's organized by different projects. So usually bite-sized sort of archival um, things or different bits of research that maybe would be difficult for to have enough staff to come take it on. So, um, and the original idea was not only that we were going to be putting up these sort of projects, but also that anyone could put up a project and get it crowdsourced. So if you were sort of an, you know an archaeology club and you had some records that you need help transcribing or digitizing, you could put that up and get some help. Um. So what became our kind of central project and how I came on board, because my background is sort of European prehistory, is uh, the Bronze Age Index, which is one of the earliest catalogs of Bronze Age tools and implements in the United Kingdom, but it covers things from all over the world. Um, and we have over 30,000 records con connected to this. And the interesting thing about it is that it's about 100 years old, and it was started by this sort of Bronze Age committee, and uh, they actually wanted to look at kind of what we today would call sort of big data. <laughs> you know, look at these kind of trends and they, um, of sort of archaeological data, because they could, they could see that things were being found in the field, and so they wanted to kind of systematically record where things were being found. Um, so it's really a precursor to what we now have, which is the portable antiquity scheme. But, and this was this was being used until sort of mid-1990s when the portable antiquity scheme got developed. So my central job of this was partially to digitize these records. And here's just an example of what some of these records look like. Um, so they're, they're really, they're lovely records. You have beautiful pictures. Most of the drawings are one-to-one. -one. <coughs> and, uh, but <laughs> as you can see, there's a lot of writing there. And we don't, unfortunately, have enough staff time to actually go and transcribe 30,000 records. So we asked the crowd to help us with that. And crazily, it was a su success. And they really you know, did went through about all the records. About 1,000 people transcribed all these records in a couple years. Um, and this is I just wanted to show a quick slide. I'm not going to go into this too much. But just sort of comparing our data with portable, ant portable antiquity scheme data. So it, it is kind of complementary. And it's something that we're kind of going back to, is to incorporate this into now these other national databases and see what we can actually get out of this. Um, <coughs> so how does kind of archival data connect to more modern data sets? So that's kind of where we started out. <laughs> um, and within this MicroPass project, we also started experimenting with 3D models. And some of those we actually asked people to help with us again in crowdsourcing. Um, so primarily drive uh, what we call masking. So drawing an outline around an object to identify the object from the background. And it just helps with the modeling process. It makes it go quicker. Um, and it was really the first time that we started using, I'll go back to that, it's the first time that we actually started doing 3D modeling systematically in the museum. So this is just in the last couple of years. There were some people who kind of went in and do it on their own in the galleries, but um, for actual research projects, this hasn't been done before. 
And we've even used it for things like studying sort of Bronze Age typologies and things like that. And we also just started experimenting with actually using purely archival resources to make 3D models. So this is um, from another project I, I work on called the African Rock Art Image Project. And this is a 30-year-old uh, archive of rock art uh, photographs, basically. Um, and it's taken by a photographer, not an archaeologist. So he donated it to the museum for us to curate because we have the expertise to actually have, have the archaeological expertise. But a lot of these images are not taken properly for 3D modeling. So we experiment with sort of, can we actually, is this going to work? <laughs> can we actually make a 3D model out of, you know, say, 10 images of a rock art site? Whereas if we were going to go into the field now and do a 3D model of a rock art site, we'd probably take like 40, 50 images at least. Um, and sometimes it works. So it's a great way of, again, trying to create a new form of public engagement out of something that's actually quite an old archive. Um, and this just showing on annotations on Sketchfab, which is a platform we've been heavily using um, to host our 3D models. And it's just, it's great because it's a social network as well as sort of just a great platform. And as I showed in the slide before, you can do annotation, you can do tours of objects and things like that. So it's great for kind of online curation. And the other thing we've sort of been experimenting with is taking this all sort of one step further. And can we then reincorporate these kind of 3D models and archival resources into more immersive experiences such as virtual reality? And the first thing we did this with was a Bronze Age roundhouse, which you see up here. Um, and that actually is based on a replica roundhouse um, up on Erin in Scotland. So they, the company that we worked with, which is Soloist, which is a company we've also worked with in Global Perspectives, went and did um, photogrammetry of this replica roundhouse. And then they embedded the 3D models that we made by crowdsourcing of Bronze Age objects and kind of brought it all together. So that was a really cool to see how they kind of did that. And we've kind of done similar techniques with other sort of projects. So for the rock art, we created a little immersive cardboard app. So you can go and see embedded rock art site and visit, visit the site, walk around, and then look at the models, 3D models of the rock art. So I just wanted to show you, <coughs> sorry, these are all really, uh, <coughs> so this is another um, project we've been working on for rock art, which is all about climate change in the Sahara and how it's reflected on the rock art sites and just how, again, how we can take 3D models and kind of try to bring them alive and get new information out to people about archaeology and the importance of archaeology to tell us this kind of key information. Now, moving on to the work that we've done more specifically with SysCheck. One of the first things we did was to create this AR leaflet, and this is just kind of a mock-up of the Shinano River Valley, which is a very important valley in, would you call it middle or north, northern Japan, middle, middle Japan, um, which is famous for its Neolithic sites and a lot of these kind of Dogo figurines, and I'll show you, I've got a few. So the first thing we did for this project is actually make 3D models of replica Dogu figurines. Um, and then we kind of thought, is this working? Okay. How can we incorporate this into a map of the River Valley and actually kind of bring it all together and get people involved? And so we, we experimented with using augmented reality through via an app called Augments, which basically you upload a 3D model. So we, we can see, sorry, this is just capture from my phone. <laughs> um, so you can kind of see that. Um, the app recognizes the image that we have on a leaflet, so the image of a map, with, which has information. And then if you scan it with the app, it brings up the model of the valley, the 3D model of the valley, with the kind of embedded 3D models. And those all indicate the sites where these objects are found. And uh, it's something that we're actually looking to possibly go back to and do a little bit more with, um, because at the moment, you can't kind of click through to more information, but ideally, you could click on those models and then bring, bring you to additional web resources. So it's something we kind of want to play with a little bit more. But it was experimental to see if we could get it to work well. And actually, it's nice that it really works. So you get a sense of it. There. Um. Is that going to work? So moving on to more specifically global perspectives, um, this is actually a map that we have on our website. So I encourage you to go and have a look. So you can click on the map and go 
and look at different um, online resources that we've developed. Um, these are the kind of key sites, and as you can see, they have little symbols that sort of represent each site. As, um, as Sam mentioned earlier, we kind of have hit sort of every major period from Paleolithic onto through medieval, um, medieval Europe. So we kind of looked at these different key periods, and uh, a lot of the work I've actually done personally has been on prehistory in East Anglia, so it's really interesting to me because it is actually obviously an incredibly significant place throughout history, but now because of just, you know, our modern geography is less well known. So it's, it's interesting to kind of bring that importance, that energy to this kind of place. So that was one of the challenges of this project. How can we incorporate sort of digital archives and digital sort of assets to kind of bring this stuff alive? So one of the things that is the reason I'm connected to the project is because obviously a lot of these sites, this I'm sure as you know is Sutton Hoo, a lot of these archives are located at the British Museum. So to gain access to the resources, we had to kind of delve in and see like what, what was available, what can we use to kind of incorporate into the project and then put together in a new and interesting way to as an educational and public outreach resource. So this is, this is literally for me exploring sort of the archives in the Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory. And this is um, Basil Brown, so the original excavator of Sutton Hoo. This is his excavation sort of notebook. Well, he has two. He has sort of, that's his notebook and that's his scrapbook. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he has sort of like a clippings book of, of sort of everything significant that happened around the excavation, some newspaper clippings, and then also letters and photographs people sent him. So it's a really amazing archive. And it's not, I mean, they're just going through it now and trying to catalog it, but it's an amazing resource. Um, and I, I actually really recommend if you haven't read it, there's a, a book about his excavations what is it called? The Dig. That's all about the kind of letters and all the sort of political intrigues amongst all the archaeologists. So there's a lot there to kind of look at. And, and obviously we have these amazing photographs of the original excavation. So, um, and the other thing we have, I'll just click again, is we have access to other digital assets. So this is up here, this little spinning model is Grimes Gave's Goddess, which is in the British Museum collections. Um, it's, as you know, it's probably a, a fake, but it's still an interesting object. So we made a 3D model of that. And then this actually is an older laser scan that English Heritage did, oh gosh, I think in the early 2000s, but hasn't really been used very much. Um, they just kind of had the files and they're sitting on them. So we wanted to try to incorporate that and see what, what can we do with this, because it's a great, it's just an amazing scan of Grimes graves. Um, so it's still really a great um, thing to have. So what we developed, and um, this is kind of goes back to the idea of almost the kind of archive, but also this is sort of our theoretical archaeologist's desk, <laughs> you know, mid-project, um, was sort of a series of short films, educational films, that incorporate a lot of these archival resources, as well as things like 3D models, um, and tell the sort of history of these sites in East Anglia, but then also com comparing them to the global sites that you know, we can work, they are connected to you, that, um, the ones that Sam was talking about earlier on. Um, and it, the, key, the key aspect here, if you, if you have a look, is this book. <laughs> so <laughs> the, these books, which we kind of initially got the idea from Basil Brown's, um, from his sort of diaries, is actually based on this book. Um, and this is a bronze and iron age scrapbook from the Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory, which as you can see has amazing sort of things sort of pasted into it from over a hundred years ago. So again, we we're kind of trying to play with that idea within the films as we got them together, that you're gonna go and explore this area and explore a site in a way, almost in the process in the way that an archeologist would. So this is our, um, our trailer.
So if you want to see the full length films for each site, I recommend going to our website because they're each about sort of two, between two and four minutes long. So we, we thought they were a bit too long to play today, but it gives you a, a sense of the style that we kind of have, have done. And um, sort of with each site, um, we've, as Sam mentioned earlier, we've kind of had special events at those sites. Um, a lot of them were connected to Heritage Open Days. And so we kind of tried to do a lot of, you know, via social media, um, sort of featuring the films and then featuring kind of online information about those sites to promote, to promote them. But at the sites as well, we were also showing the films. Um, so it was a sort of thing where we tried to do something special. So like, for instance, um, one of the, probably the most unique ones was Haysboro because that, as you know, is sort of footprints Paleolithic footprints along the coast, um, and we got the excavators, Nick Ashton, to come along and tell us all about it and give us a tour of the sort of Paleolithic coast, which was amazing. So that was a really unique experience for visitors. Um, but then we also then, in the village, put the information about the site and showed the films so people can kind of contextualize it along with the globe and then see kind of the other sites are connected. So we tried to kind of connect up all the assets we were doing together. Um, and we had a sort of big blowout event in October, right? in the forum in Norwich, because obviously uh, this is based out of uh, UEA, so it's based in Norwich, where we showed sort of all the films. And um, we also did things, this is, um, again, this is Solus, our, our sort of technology <coughs> that we've been working with, um, you know, doing some 3D, some VR stuff with, um, with the kids. But the interesting thing about the films was that, surprisingly, we thought, oh, people kind of pop in and have a look for a minute. But people were sitting there and watched every single film. So they're sitting in there for over an hour watching these films over and over again. So we thought, that's really interesting. We, <laughs> we didn't expect that. We thought they'd pop in for a couple minutes and then kind of go on their way, because this, this is sort of within the main shopping district of Norwich. So, so we got some really good in, you know, feedback from it, and people did actually find it quite compelling, which is, which is a nice output. Um, so that's actually my last slide. And I forgot to put, sorry, I forgot to put the Twitter handle on here, but it's at Global Brit Arc, so please follow us. <laughs> Thank you.